Abandon Ideology. Hey, welcome to Parker's Pensy's YouTube channel. This is a channel where I explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I really love thinking about cool stuff, and you're invited to come think with me. This is the sixth of an installment of 12 uh, in a series that I'm doing on Jordan Peterson's new book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. I'll be doing uh, an episode on each one of his rules, going over it in an overview, and then giving you an analysis. And I'm a Christian, so it's going to be a Christian analysis. I am an evangelical Christian, and I mean that in the theological sense and not necessarily the political sense. So I'm going to be going through rule number six, which is abandon ideology. And at the end, I'm going to be asking the question, is this an ideology itself? Is this self-defeating? I well, we'll see when we get there. <clears throat> if you if you guys like this at all, if you like this uh, type of content, then subscribe to my channel. Go click that subscribe button right now. Um, if you like the the podcast, then you're gonna like this. If you like this, then you're gonna like the podcast. So go over to my channel and check out the Parker's Pensies podcast. And um, yeah, if you like Jordan Peterson stuff, you're in the right spot. <clears throat> so uh, let's just jump right into rule number six: abandon ideology. Peterson starts this chapter <clears throat> by recounting his time as a uh, public speaker, as a public intellectual, and he describes what he's learned for us. He says this, this fantastic line on page 159, helping people bridge the gap between what they profoundly intuit but cannot articulate seems to be a reasonable and valuable function of a public intellectual. So he's getting at what Michael Pogliani calls tacit knowledge. And so the, the public has this tacit knowledge of something that they intuit uh, very deeply. They, they have this deep knowledge of it, but they can't really explain it. They can't describe why it's true. And so Peterson says that the role of a public intellectual is to help them think through that, make that tacit knowledge explicit, to help them explain what they already know. He says that's a reasonable and valuable function of a public intellectual. I think that's probably true. I think that's a good if not definition, it's it's at least one of the key factors uh, that a public intellectual ought to be striving for. <clears throat> um, but Peterson continues on. He says what he's learned from his time as a public intellectual, making all this tacit intuitive knowledge explicit in his hearers and his listeners and his audience. He says he's discovered that we've been far too preoccupied just clamoring around about rights. In the West, that's what we really care about. Don't mess with my rights. I have my rights. Back off. I have rights. Peterson says we ought to have been discussing meaning a bit more. We have this, this huge meaning crisis that seems like more and more people are aware of, but not enough. Like You look around in the news and you see drug use, you see suicides, you see the loss of meaning, and people aren't talking about it as they should. And Peterson says a big part of that is because we've been preoccupied talking about rights instead of meaning. But meaning, the meaning which comes from shouldering... Um, a noble burden that can sustain you in times of trouble that can sustain you uh, when there's disappointment, when there's tragedy and, and all this is sure to come. So if you don't have any kind of meaning, any kind of ballast in your boat and when the trouble comes, the rights talk isn't going to be enough for you. I would go further and say the rights, the rights kind of conversation is situated. It's nested in a meaning conversation anyways, right? So why do we have rights? Where do rights come from? Well, like I said at the beginning of this, I'm a Christian. I think they're inalienable. They can't be taken from you. They can't be alienated from you. You can't be alienated from your rights because you're made in God's image. And so the, the deeper meaning there is actually what gives rise to our rights in the first place. And Peterson's right. We've had a very shallow conversation that has not plumbed the depths uh, or looked at the, examined the foundations of our rights in a, in a long, long time. So then Peterson goes on in classic Peterson fashion, and he discusses, you guessed it, Nietzsche and uh, Dostoevsky. And uh, in, in Nietzsche's God is Dead movement, his proclamation, uh, Peterson says that this was not a, a triumphant proclamation. He was lamenting the fact that God is dead, that there is no God who serves as the foundation for our rights, for the meaning that we have, or, or supposed we had, for our values, right? So so Nietzsche was was terrified in this. He wasn't excited. Yay, God's dead. Everything's cool. And he was like, this is going to be bad. 
when everyone wakes up to this fact, it's going to be real bad. And furthermore, uh, Peterson says Dostoevsky, around the exact same time, made the same connection in the book uh, Demons, or um, it's been translated under different names, Devils, or um, uh, I forgot the other one that it was. <clears throat> but but each one of these, uh, or the Possessed, I think is the other one, they each had this, this premonition that communism was coming, and it's going to appear dreadfully attractive to those who have lost the idea of God, who, who, for whom God is dead. Well, we need this, what, what Nietzsche called, uh, Nietzsche called an ubermensch, a superman. And for Nietzsche, he was a little bit more um, happy about this part. He was a little bit more optimistic that we could have a, look, I'm not a, a Nietzsche scholar. I'm sure someone out there might say he was actually pessimistic about this one as well, but it seems like he's optimistic that there can be a ubermensch who's going to come and transvaluate values, who's going to give us new values, superior, you know, scary values, if you know anything about what, what Nietzsche liked. Whereas Dostoevsky was a little bit more pessimistic, be, uh, being an, an Orthodox Christian himself. And I mean, Orthodox in the Eastern sense. He, he wasn't as happy about that. But um, <clears throat> what Peterson sets up this conversation between uh, the, the German and the Russian to say, that the role of the subjective perspective is it's being threatened by the third person scientific perspective. And that's what ideology, that's where ideology resides in the third person perspective. And so without, without an objectivity, this is, this is kind of weird where Peterson, um, he weds postmodernism and communism together where postmodernism is kind of the, uh, kind of the, proposing of it's it's the elevating of the personal perspective over against any other any third person perspective or second person perspective and uh, the communist ethic which is the collective the third person perspective against the individual no no the collective is important and peterson finds this this weird uh, bedfellow situation between the two of them but what he's saying uh in in this conversation of nietzsche and dostoevsky is Hey, look, this, this role of the subjective perspective, that's probably where meaning comes from. He said early in the chapter, right? He said, we need meaning, but we've, we've lost it. If meaning resides in the subjective perspective, we can't diminish that by buying into some ideology and following the ideal ideologues who will prop up the third person perspective against the first person perspective. <clears throat> so again, if, meaning resides in the first person perspective, then you don't want to follow these ide ideologies who subjugate that or relegate that to the trash bin or, or get rid of the subjective part where meaning resides. So uh, Peterson on page 166 says, <clears throat> it may well be therefore that the true meaning of life is not to be found in what is objective, but in what is subjective, but still universal. The existence of conscience for example, provides some evidence for that, as does the fact that religious experiences can reliably be induced chemically, as well as through practices practices such as dancing, chanting, fasting, and meditating. So, uh, all right, I don't really fully understand why he brought in the, the drugs aspect there, except to maybe say that there's a psychological aspect, and um, it's not just a, a spiritual airy-fairy type thing in your soul or spirit, but that it is biochemical as well. Okay, that's cool, I guess. He, he gives a, a brief defense of religion there. But his his major point as he's continuing on into the chapter is that, look, this is really, really important, the subjective perspective. It might be more important than the objective, but nonetheless, it's still something you don't want to uh, reduce. Uh, he's anti-reductionistic in this way. And in this little quote that I just read, he's, he's following um, guys like Thomas Nagel who argue in the view from nowhere that reality is more than objective reality. It's also subjective reality. And there's, what is it, 7 billion people on the earth, each with their own subjective perspective. And to say that all we need is the objective perspective is, one, to try and find a view from nowhere. Like, what is that objective third-person perspective? Where is that? Where can we find that? If not from a person's point of view. And then secondly, you've just erased out of reality or yeah, out of reality, you've erased 7 billion perspectives. 
And so you have 7 billion holes in reality, and you're calling it objective reality. So that's that's Peterson's point here. And he's this whole time he's preempting us against the, uh, the allure of the ideologues who would have you believe this story that is not very fine-grained, but who has its villains, who, eh, who which might not relate to reality whatsoever. <clears throat> So uh, uh, ideology is is collectivist and temp- tends to stamp out the individuality and subjectivity wherein meaning resides. So then Peterson has this this great treatment of uh, the idolatry of isms that that isms turn out to be idols, which, as a Christian, again I, I think is fantastic. <clears throat> On page sixty eight, this can be a longer one, so stay with me here. Consider those who have not gone so far as to adopt the discredited ideologies of the Marxist, Leninists, and the Nazis, but who still maintain faith in the commonplace isms characterizing the modern world. Conservatism, socialism, feminism, and all other manners of ethic, ethnic and gender study isms, postmodernism, environmentalism, amongst others. They are all monotheists practically speaking, or polytheistic worshippers of a very small number of gods. These gods are the axioms and foundational beliefs that must be accepted a priori rather than proven before the system can be adopted, and when accepted and applied to the world, allow the illusion to prevail that knowledge has been produced. The process by which an ism system can be generated is simple in its initial stages, but Baroque enough in its application to mimic and replace actual productive theorizing. The ideologue begins by selecting a few abstractions in whose low resolution representations hide large, undifferentiated chunks of the world. Some examples include the economy, the nation, the environment, the patriarchy, the people, the rich, the poor, the oppressed, and the oppressors. <clears throat> I love that. I think that's so fantastic. That's really, really, really helpful when thinking through what an ideologue, ideologue does, what ideology uh, consists in, what what it deals in, what it's promising and hoping. So Peterson saying, and Peterson uses this language of fine grained and and not fine grained, or <clears throat> uh, low resolution would be the opposite of fine grained. So. Something's all pixelated and it's not very clear to see. I'm like me right now because I got this new camera. I look super fine grained. This is awesome. So low resolution, uh, you you take this low resolution idea like the economy. Well, is it it's, is it vague? Is it ambiguous? It's, it might be even hard to tell between the two in this uh, situation. But the economy is not fine grained. <clears throat> it is uh, low resolution. It is not fine grained. It's this big concept, and you can say, well, for the good of the economy, for the good of the nation, for the good of the environment, for the good, or uh, let's fight against the patriarchy, you know, for the people, against the rich, for the poor, the oppressed. And what Peterson's point is not that we shouldn't fight for these things, but that we should get a clear idea of what the heck we're talking about. What are we talking about here? And if you say this, this one system, this one law, this one rule, this one uh, administration is going to be bad for the people or be bad for the rich, or this will hurt the oppressed or give rise to the patriarchy. Like, what are you talking about there? It's, it's, it strikes at the intuitive level, but you're not doing what the, the public intellectual is supposed to do. And you're not bringing clarity. You're not bringing a fine grained understanding of that to the people. You've just You've taken that low resolution uh, intuitive idea that they have of the people, and you're making you're making it even less finely degrained, uh, uh, finely grained. You're making it even lower in its resolution. And so from here, you can have all sorts of you can you can go against your rivals and you can call them your enemies. You can set up this whole story. <clears throat> you can identify the villains. You can use impenetrable vocabulary and the more impenetrable the better the the more you you like hegel the more you use language that people can't penetrate the more stupid they'll feel if uh everyone's talking about it and they have no idea what so let's go along i don't know what they're talking about but i'm going to pretend like i do because i don't get these weird uh, poly symbolic uh polys many uh syllabled 
uh, words. Yeah, it's good. I didn't use that, I guess. Good thing I couldn't think of that word. Um, in, in German, like all these words put together, I don't know what they mean, but I'm going to go along with it to get along. Peterson says, this is kind of the, this is not kind of, this is the formula for creating an ideology. He then has this awesome comparison between uh, ideologues and fundies, fundamentalists. <clears throat> and this is on page 173. He says, ideologues are the intellectual equivalent of fundamentalists, unyielding and rigid. Their self-righteous and moral claim to social engineering is every bit as deep and dangerous. It might even be worse. Ideologues lay claim to rationality itself. So he goes on to say that, you know, the, the fundies, the, the religious fundamentalists, they who I might be one, depending on who you are, you know, I, I consider myself an evangelical, right? I'm I'm trying to be fundamentalist in my beliefs. I believe the fun fundamentals of the faith, but I also want to be culturally affirming. I, I don't want to be irrational or say you have to take, take a blind leap of faith. I want to reason with people. I'm not liberal in that I'm not trying to reach you so bad that I'm letting go of the fundamentals of my faith. <clears throat> so that's kind of been the historical, theological, evangelical um, understanding of, of, of evangelical. But what he's got in mind here about fundies are the ones who are anti-rational. And they're saying, I believe this and there's nothing you can do. There's no kind of reason or argument that can penetrate here. Um, I, I got my believies and I'm standing on my believies real hard. But Peterson says those fundies might even be better than the ideologues because the ideologues lay claim to reason itself. They say, there is nothing that my system, my ideology does not cover. My ideology is universal and it makes everything clear. And so to step outside of my, idea my ideology is to step outside reason itself. You're being irrational for not believing what I believe. Whereas Peterson says the fundamentalists at least hold on to the transcendent. There's something in their system for, for most fundies, it's the core of their system, it's the cornerstone of their system, it's the foundation of their system, is unpenetrable. It is uncomprehendable. Um, not, not that it's irrational. Well, so he says the fundies are irrational. But the thing in itself, God, is transcendent and thus cannot be fully comprehended. And so in, in Christian theology, we call this the doctrine of incomprehensibility, that God can be under understood but not fully understood we can't master him with our mind or with our uh, speech <clears throat> and so peterson is saying at least for the fundy there's something that evades uh full conceptualization in the system but for the ideologue however nothing remains outside understanding or mastery and so again he's he's guarding against the the totalitarianism that he finds in the, the Marxist Leninists and the, the Nazis and in the in the ideologies as they grow. So this again, this is order at its worst. This is pathological order. These ideologies, and this is one that I think this rule fits perfectly in this book, Beyond Order. Some of them you'll recall if you've listened to my other episodes, might not fit perfectly. It's like, I don't know, this could have been in, in the first book, uh, 12 Rules for Life, you know, an antidote for chaos. This is supposed to be about order. This one fits perfectly because ideology is that type of, was it left brain? No, right? Yeah, left brain, order, explored territory. Again, from his Maps of Meaning book, he really wants to ground everything into our neurochemistry, our, our neural um, biology. That you have this right brain and this left brain, and right brain's all creative, and left brain is the exploratory, the exploratory um, going out there and reaching and, and finding uh, new things. And so... The ideologue is the pathological father who says, this is the system that I have, and I've, I have an explanation for everything in reality. And you can't leave my explored territory, uh, or that puts you outside of grace. That puts you outside, because he set up his ideology in the place of God. Uh, to step out of the ideology is to be a heretic. But the problem is, this is not a transcendent real religion. They don't even claim that. They say that there is nothing transcendent. The ide the ideology is all. And so it's bonkers because they're putting something in the place of God that they willingly say is not God and can't function as God. <clears throat> so um, ideologues are the worst. The moral of the story, beware of intellectuals who make, mo make a monotheism out of their theories of motivation. Beware of intellectuals who make a monotheism out of their 
theories of motivation. So uh, instead of going to an ideologue and, and blaming the villains, what are we supposed to do? Well, Peterson says, you know, see the log in your own eye and take that out. Take the log out of your own eye. You are likely to be much more clear-minded about what is... <clears throat> Well, uh, you're sorry. You are more likely to be. You are likely to be much more clear-minded about what is what and who is who and where blame lies once you contemplate the log in your own eye, rather than the speck in your neighbor's eye. It is probable that your own imperfections are evident and plentiful and could profitably be addressed as step one in your redeemer's quest to improve the world to take the world's sins onto yourself, to assume responsibility for the fact that things have not been set right in your own life and elsewhere, is part of the messianic path, part of the imitation of the hero in the most profound of senses. So he's he's clearly, I mean, he's quoting Christ there. Don't look at the speck in your neighbor's eye, but first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to, to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And then he's, he's talking about the Messiah as well, part of the, mess, the messianic path, the, the imitation of the true hero. And again, for Peterson, the true hero is instantiated in, in the Christ figure who surfs the uh, wave between order and chaos, creating order out of chaos, who goes out to unexplored territory and makes it explored. That's the true hero. And so the, ide the ideologue wants you to join them in mapped territory, which is not really mapped, it's a false map of, of the, the territory, because this ideologue has ballooned up his ideology to an all-encompassing religion, a worldview, religion, depending on how you use those phrases, but he's blown it out of proportion, and he's trying to give you the, expl he or she is trying to give you the explanation for everything from a system that cannot do that. So it's a fake map on reality, which rightly fits in, uh, <clears throat> This, this Beyond Order book. We need to get beyond this. Don't follow the ideologue in blaming everyone else and seeing the other world and, and not thinking for yourself, but giving into the third-person perspective and ignoring the first-person perspective where meaning resides, where you shoulder a, a burden that gives you meaning, that's a ballast in your boat. Don't do that, but actually examine yourself and say, hey, the world's problems might be my problem. I might be re more responsible for that than I'm then I've given myself credit for. I should take on uh, this this hero's journey. This the, I should follow the Messiah in saying, "Hey, I'm going to take on the sins of the world. I'm going to act as if uh, this is my fault, and I'm going to start making things around me better. I'm going to clean my bloody room." <clears throat> Peterson also talks about the, the the sophistication of the writers that we really admire. They don't put evil outside of the hero or outside of the main characters, but they put this battle between good and evil, the yin and yang, uh, the light and dark, right in the heart of their own character. And that actually represents like the roughness and density of life that, that C.S. Lewis talks about. Um, Peterson says that that's because that's who we are, right? We have that good and evil inside of us, and a lot of us have done a lot of evil. You need to recognize that in yourself. And I think that's, that's a really good lesson. Um, it, it, it resonates with the Christian doctrine of total depravity, that you're not, we're not all serial killers, but we all have been touched by sin in every aspect of our being, including our cognitive faculties as well. So what do I, what do I think ultimately of this rule? Um, I think it's great. I think you should abandon ideology. I think that you should not make ideology into a God. John Calvin says our hearts are idol factories meaning like we will invent new idols daily. We pump out new idols. And making an ideology into an idol is horrible. If conservatism is your religion, you suck. If liberalism or wokeism or however, like that's the worst. That is not able to function as your God. And you will try to, in, you'll try to put that on everyone else. And you have all these rituals that you have for how you get back from when you've fallen from grace. And all these human-made uh, traditions that leave us worse off than we were before they got here. So I think we should abandon ideology. My question for Peterson is, he, he does follow Nietzsche in saying that God is dead. He says, God is dead and, and ideologies are dead because uh, the, 20, uh, the 20th century showed us that. You know, look at, look at uh, how communism rolled through and killed millions of people. Look at how Nazism rolled through and killed millions of people. 
obviously ideologies should be dead. And these ideologies arose because the death of God movement, people stopped believing in God as the foundation of society and our morals. And so it was an up for grabs everywhere. And then the Ubermensch came through, right? Like, like Stalin and Hitler were Ubermensches and they, they had a transvaluation of values and they reordered the uh, moral systems of their societies and it was deadly and horrible. And so Peterson does say though, he says, you know, God is dead and ideology is dead. So let's abandon ideology. Now, what he believes about God is anyone's guess. Uh, it, it depends on what side of the bed Peterson woke up that day. But if there is no God, then are we treating Peterson's rules for life 24 of them so far with the two books are these uh, uh, a set of ideology like is, is is he an ideologue does he he says have some humility clean up your bedroom take care of your family follow your conscience straighten up your life find something productive and interesting to do and commit to it when you can do all that find a bigger problem and try to solve that if you dare if that works too move on to even more ambitious projects and as Necessary beginning to that, as the necessary beginning of that process, abandon ideology. This might be self-defeating. If that's an ideology and he's telling us to abandon ideology, then I have to follow an ideology to abandon ideology. By the time I get to abandoning ideology, I cut off the ladder I use to climb up to the roof. You know, the, the roof is the rule. Rule number six, abandon ideology. But there's it's an ideological ladder I'm, cl I'm climbing up, so I would never actually get to the roof. If this is an ideology that's being set up in the place of theology, right? It's it's taking the place of God or the Ten Commandments or whatever, God's word, God's law. Like Peterson, you might be self-defeating here. Like you might be giving us a self-defeating proposition. Abandon ideology. It's like saying this sentence that I'm saying right now is a lie. Actually, that's a paradox um, because if it's true, it's not true. So maybe it's paradoxical. Maybe it's actually self-defeating because to to perform it would be to deny its truth. So I think that that might be closer. I want to be charitable. Um, I like Peterson. I love Peterson. I love this guy. Dude, I want to talk with this guy sometime. If any of you know him and can get him this video, I doubt it. But if you do, that'd be awesome. And I would be grateful to you. I, I don't want to say that he's self-defeating, but I'm not sure what to do. He's told us that. These ideologies and the ideologues who invent them are, they, they set themselves up in the place of God. They become idols. Now, Peterson doesn't have room for God in his system. Does he? I really don't know. Does, does he really know? Has he told us that there is a God who is an ontological being, a necessary being, who is spirit, who actually exists, who doesn't just exist in the collective unconscious? unconscious? Who, like, if not, if Peterson says no, then I think that he's setting up an ideology that's trying to displace theology and thus is an ideology that is worth abandoning. Or you need to say, abandon bad ideologies, right? You could give some more criteria. Here's a bad ideology and here's what bad ideologies do. But here's a good ideology. And when, when not ballooned up to an entire worldview, you can fruitfully employ this ideology. You can live this part of, of the ideology out, or you can live this small ideology out in your grander system, your larger system. But without any kind of criteria to adjudicate between good and bad ideologies, we're left with abandon all ideology. Well, including this ideology. Like, it's, it's giving me a hard time because I'm not quite sure how his system isn't an ideology. Since it's not a religion... He's not claiming it's a religion. It seems like it's an ideology. He might be an ideologue. I have no problem with that if there's such thing as good ideology. It seems like he's saying all ideology is bad and must be abandoned, which might be a res might result in performative inconsistency. Like to say that is to deny that. Um, abandon ideology, including this ideology. Well, should I abandon that? Like I'd never even start that sentence. I don't know. You can see that it's giving me a hard time because I love Peterson, but he's not a Christian. And that might be the problem here, that, that this might be an ideology which is at odds with proper theology or theology proper, which is the study of God. So that's that's my take. Uh, you guys let me know what you think. If you've read the chapter, 
I want to hear from you. If you haven't read it and you've just watched this video, that's cool too. I would love to hear your thoughts. Is Peterson uh, engaging in performative self uh, refutation or self defeat? Is he being performatively inconsistent in telling us to abandon ideology, even as he gives us an ideology to accept? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Would love to hear from you. If you like this episode, then you will love my part, my podcast, Parker's Pensies. Go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel and uh, look forward to in engaging with you guys and hearing some of your thoughts. Peace.